Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, in which we are playing as the All-Russian Government of Amur. If you'd like to read about them, please go right ahead as I scroll down and it looks like we start off with some very funny symbols that can mean a whole lot of different things to a whole lot of different people. But we start off with three whole divisions, which is not very good, but God, Nation, and Labor. Let's forge on ahead and grab uh, Shekarev. No, Vasily Tersin. But let's start at the top. The true heir of Habim. Fate was truly generous to the long suffering Russian people as it sent Konstantin, Vladimir, Radzevsky, and the Russian Dudas party to its rescue from the de decades of Judeo Bolshevik slaughter. A spark that was ignited through the rightful anger of the young and patriotic exiles of Habin became a flame that would spread across the Russian Far East, bringing freedom to the oppressed Russians and punishment to the forces of the Soviet tyranny. The determination of the Dudist heroes, the sacrifices and feats they made in the name of Russia and God are the true manifest of legitimacy of the Russian F-word party and the dearest Vod as the vanguard of the Russian anti-communist struggle, even if our efforts were sabotaged by, by, the, by the betrayal of Semyonov and Mykovsky cliques. Our will has never been more firm. Our true purpose, the total liberation of Holy Russia under the Dudas banner, only began its incarnation. Either it will mock the greatest point in Russian history or end in a total subservience to Jewish overlords. We get more political power and war support, which is very nice. In which we might as well and go ahead and read about contact the Japanese. In the darkest years of communist tyranny, the conscientious and patriotic exiles of Habim could not ask for a better ally than the ma magnificent neighbor of Nippon, or Na Empire Nippon. A state which did not know the Jewish influence for millennia, it rose as a preeminent power of free Asia that rejected the values of the mercantile and semantic civilization and cherished honor tradition. The moral virtues of the Japanese are truly the opposite to those of the Jews. The Japanese establishment was not blind to the threat coming from the Soviet Empire and was fully aware of the role of which the RFP was to play in the anti-Bolshevik crusade. It was the Empire of the Rising Sun that directed <clears throat> our efforts towards the recapture of Primuri and aided our forces with the guns and butter against the Red Armies. Even though Japan withdrew from Russian affairs, it doesn't mean the Empire can no longer assist in our struggle by any means. The Vaz will show himself as a worthy ally to the Chrysanthemum throne and prove his willingness to continue our good relations on good terms. The steadfast secretary, though. <clears throat> For most people in Amur, being in an RFP interrogation facility would be a surefire death sentence. For Lev Okotin, secretary of the RFP and right-hand man of the Vaz, it was just another day of the week. Screams rang out in the dimly lit facility, which Okotin was storing as part of his official duties. But for a place like this, you learned to make the cries for help into background noise. All of Amur had, just once, he glanced into a chamber and he saw a broken man pleading in a hoarse voice for help. Without a second thought, Okotin turned away and left him, left him to his fate. Whatever the man had been through, he was undoubtedly deserved it. After all, the Vaz willed it. Ohokton knew there was a great moral good to aiding Rodzevsky's cause in spite of the seemingly gruesome nature of it, such as crushing the Bolsheviks that had driven them out of all their homes, and the Jews who had guided that disastrous revolution. In any case, he knew that Rodzevsky was doing the right thing because he plus his trace his trust in the Vaz, just as he trusted him. That was the foundation of their friendship, a bond forged through a mutual hatred of the subhumans during their days in Habin, and strong enough to resist any attempt by lesser men to poison it. Although, Ahokten thought, as yet another pained screamed fill the air, that last part might not do be true anymore. With what Bolotov was capable of and willing to do, he feared the day of his own name would be included among those who t the torture whispered to Rodzewski, feeding the paranoia and the vase that Ohokten believed in even now. The belief was that all he really had. Cool. And we'll keep scavenging for this up on the I don't usually don't do, but we're looking not very good. We're going to contact the Japanese, though, <clears throat> and see what we can do with those guys. Ooh, anything here, actually, yet? We have, do we have six? No, there's just six. That's fine. The Morgan Bucketeer, if you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. An interesting story, if nothing else. The free, uh, free all-Russian army. I like that. We definitely need that God, Nation, and Labor. We need that as well. I'm going to grab... Stability is really good to grab, though. God, Nation, and Labor. With the slogan, the Russian fascist party made itself known when it was first formed by the visionary members of the white emigres and Habim. In those words, lies power and strength of the Russian fascism as a constructive force, directed towards recovery and improvement of all Russian state. On those glorious principles, a reborn Russia will sit on with dignity, a Russia without the tainting influence of Jewish materialism and the cannibalistic notion of class struggle. But the dream of a nationalist Russia, guided by God and bonded by collaboration between classes, will remain an unreachable dream if every Russian fascist will not discipline himself to the most glorious cause 
cause will not be ready to sacrifice his life for the service of the Russian nation. To oversee the transformation of the all-Russian state, the party will take the affairs of the spiritual and material world into its own hands, guiding the obedient people to the enlightened spirit of fascism and the Vaz of the Russians. A cold eastern wind rattled the shutters of the Vaz office window, wh wh whistling as it slipped between the thin wooden slates. Rodzevsky shivered and drew the heavy gray coat closer around his shoulders, closing the fur lining around his neck to try and keep the warmth in. Only his face and hands were exposed to the chilly air of his makeshift HQ, intense eyes tracing around the page before him, as his numb fingers scrawled out a new addition to the manifesto of the Russian National Socialism. The ancient clock on the wall chimed a single peal, signifying that one o'clock in the morning had come as he reached the bottom of the page and downed his pen. It was the third night in a row that Rodzewski had stayed up late to continue work on his magnum opus. He had thought it complete long ago, but the sudden collapse of Red Authority and the mockery of Rush had maintained a change of situation. Without the aid of the Japanese, he had gone from Habin to distant Zeya on the river Anmur in just a few days short. In that short period of time, just a few years prior, the fortunes of the Russia's fascist party had changed completely. That hadn't lasted long, of course. The thought of Metkovsky's betrayal and the split of the RFP stoked the fire of hate in the Vod's gut, and reached for a flask of vodka beside him to quench it. The taste vile and stomach churning as a betrayal did little to soothe his temper, but he ignored it and took another deep swig. Yum yum! It would do its job eventually, in that it was just like the assorted rabble that a state that called an army. Crude, ill-formed, hammered out of whatever was lying around just to make something functional, but it was his. It was Russia's. For only here was Russia to be found, beyond Amur's borders, there lay only traitors, subhumans, and reds, the collective boot on the throat of the Russian people. Someday he would have his chance, someday as a vodka saw him through one hard day after another. The RFP would see Russia through this trial. Someday, the last hundred. In the small offices in Zaya, Mikhail Spakovsky took a cigarette out of his mouth and let her breath fill with smoke. He let it out. He was getting old, there was no denying that. That didn't mean he was about to refuse himself the last comforts available to him. With a sigh, he turned his attention to the paperwork in front of him. It was all meaningless messages to and from the Japanese, the only real allies remaining to the government in Amur. It was Spazovsky's job to make sure they remained friendly to Rozevsky's aims, which usually meant agreeing with everything they said and signing where they wanted him to sign. None of them were really in a position to bargain with, Jap with Japan after all. Spazovsky. Uh, thought back to his youth, when everything had seemed hopeful for a cause, when the Black Hundreds had been strong and he had been a member. Now, their vision for Russia seemed like a distant dream, with Jews and commies t running loose all over Russia and spreading their filth. He hated all of them for that, without question, however. He was not only old, but incredibly tired. There wasn't enough energy left in him to really care about what had happened, especially since he had a feeling that he wouldn't live to enjoy it. Deciding that he needed to focus just a little more, he put out the cigarette and picked up his pen, returning to his endless work on the foreign affairs of the RFP. Though he might never see it again, the he would at least try to help Rozeski one day make the Jew and the Bolshevik pay for their disgusting existences. <clears throat> to the very day he died. From heck, he would laugh. And Borman has been named successor. Oh boy. Yeah, this is not very good with only three divisions here, but the snake? Alexander Bolotov rose with the sun. He always had, and he would always continue to do so. It was a habit he'd got into during his youth, and he stuck to it. As he rose from bed, the first thing that the all-Russian government security minister noticed was his pounding headache. Typical, he muttered to himself. As he swung his legs onto the chilly wooden floor and sat up, he recalled that his briefings were expected by the Vazna this morning. Slipping on his clothes, or slipping them on, trimming his beard and preparing for the day, Bolotov only had one thing in mind. As he finished his modest breakfast, consumed out of habit, not hunger, he went back to his bedroom, bedroom and from the under a false bottom in his dressery pulled out an ornate wooden box once open bolotov stared at the nondescript cigarettes with a lustful stare morphine he carefully rolled up his sleeve after sitting on his bed and selected a cigarette unsheathing its needle he picked up the phone and kept he kept on the nightstand and dowed vladimir gobelstov one of his many act scions as a line rang through bolotov jammed the cigarette into his arm almost immediately his headache began to recede and his muddle of brain fog began to clear Sighing blissfully, his moment of tranquility was interrupted by Golubsov's gruff voice on the other end. After cursory greetings, Bolotov asked about his informants. We're still working on them pretty hard, boss, Golubsov reported. But don't worry, we'll get them talking. Bolubsov, satisfied, reminded him that he needed the documents implicating another half-dozen party members at his office before he got there. And Golubsov assured him that they were already there. After sinister, don't make me come looking. He placed the phone back on the receiver, unrolled his sleeve, and went to leave. As he reached the front door, he stuffed himself into his warm jacket, and it felt the cold metal of the pistol he always kept with him. He planned to use a gun that day. Ah, don't you love warm bliss? Especially when you're using nothing but drugs. Oh, isn't that nice? Don't quote me on that. We don't use drugs here, do we? Those are for degenerates, are they? I don't know. Don't, have, don't quote me on anything. Yeah, that'd be really bad if you did. But whatever. Contact the Japanese. We love the Japanese. God, nation, and labor. Political power and stability, because we gotta get that stability. We gotta get it. Ooh, they determined with the matter of Black... Blagoveshenk. 
Blagoveshchik is a town of little worth and even less significance. At least that's how the Japanese see it. Renaming it to Haipau, Haipau, when it was annexed into their miserable pu puppet kingdom of Manchukuo, as they did when they stole the great eastern jewel of Vladivostok. To Rozevsky, however, it means a world, and for it is the Vod's hometown, it is therefore also the birthplace of the RFP and the Russian National Socialism. And once we hold the entirety of Russia, it will be the birthplace of the nation itself. As any good nationalist knows, having one's home occupied by foreign invaders is an unacceptable state of affairs, and does severe harm to the morale of the people. Just as the Tsars would have fought tooth and nail for St. Petersburg, we must have Blagoveshchik. Oh, Blagoveshchik. Thankfully, since neither the Japanese nor the Manchu servants have any real interest in the town, they're unlikely to have any good reason for turning down the Vod's righteous demands for sovereign territory. They will lose a troublesome population and gain our internal gratitude with the addition of some reasonable concessions to the greedy industrials. No doubt, I'm sure they'll agree, but they're determined. Gregory Sherarev. Shekarev checked the time on his watch, quarter to nine in the morning, time enough for the leader of the black shirts, the Russian fascist party's paramilitary wing, to make his way to party HQ for his meeting, sitting at his desk. He pulled out two small, leather-bound books, one black, one brown. Opening the cracked spine of the black book, he looked at his appointments for the day to be sure he wouldn't miss any. As he looked well into the afternoon, he grimaced, a conference with the security minister, Alexander Bolotov, and the Vaz himself. The Vaz he could handle, despite his leader's seemingly ever-increasing paranoia, it was Bolotov that he couldn't stomach. With the lunging of Russia proper following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the RFP had a shot at forming a legitimate state to abandon the thuggery and mafia-like tactics which had defined their stay in the city of Habim. It wasn't the violence that Shekharev disliked, it was the seemingly mindless character that was associated with Bolotov's unique brand, as if he and those in his employ were rabid dogs. Bolotov apparently had no intention to ever depart from his ways despite Shekharev's continued urgings. If Shekharev was an integral and a good friend of the Vaz, he was sure he would have been shot by the morphine addict long ago. Closing the black book and keeping the brown, and opening the brown one, he looked through his journal, meticulously kept ever since the early days of his involvement with the party. He remembered his failed career as a teacher and a tinge of yearning for the days of Habin. Looking at the fate of pages, the leader of the black church resolved that he would serve faithfully in his post, both officially in the black church and unofficially as a force for civilizing the party he loved. Humanizing the Vaz? Why? To find the enemy. Persecute the enemies of the Russian people? Rozeski's paranoia. Proud Russian industry. I like that. Eyes in every home. Not bad. A supreme new council. Get more political power, which is really nice. Division organization goes really down for a year, though. Wow. Our own patriarch? Heart of darkness. I don't mind that one. The paranoia of the Vaz. I like that a lot, actually, quite a bit. National unions are not bad. Work will set you free. I like that. Oh, we get Corvy slavery. Oh, that's cool. Test of slavery. Oh, it's just a loyalty. Cool. Why don't you use Vaz? Um, you do get, well, it's not bad. The corporate state, not bad either. Factory Fair Speed is very nice. An Iron Grip. I think I want to do this as much, as fast as possible, because, yeah, let's do this one. Yeah, just because we need a big military immediately, so. The free all-Russian army. Even though this is pretty good to do as well. Mm, nah, we'll get this one first. I like factories. Ever since its uprising, the fa Russian fascist movement advocated the creation of a truly national industry in Polish Bolshevik Russia. An independent, self-sufficient industry that doesn't rely on an international or any other foreign capital and instead serves the interests of the Russian nation first and foremost, an industry which follows a way of strengthening, recreating, or recreation of the national economy. The fascist system abroad traditionally had an old ally in support in small business. While we don't deny their pleas, the demands of our age requires us to pay special attention to heavy industry, a key player in supplying the war effort. From a few rust factories in Amur, Russia will see a rebirth of the Russian industry that will be directly tied to the interests of the state and the nation. Good. Improve relations? Uh, we could probably go and do that. I want to go and do equipment and then there you go. Buy Japanese electronics? Yeah, we definitely have to buy a lot of stuff here. We need to get better support with these guys, so. Reunification of Russia. Nothing about that little territory we could hopefully get. Oral development is nice. Not bad, not bad. And we can't do anything else because we already kind of bought them off, but whatever. And all we can afford right now is to make guns, maybe. And maybe some anti-tank. Uh, we're not even in any position to actually raid anybody. Oh, actually, Aldan. Actually, how many divisions? No manpower, two divisions. We actually might be okay, doing okay against them. Uh, Aldan. They don't have treasure right now, which is fine. God, nation, and labor. Uh, yeah. Proud Russian industry is going to be very good for us to do. And follow up with what? Paranoia. I'm not sure if we need to max do as fast as possible, but Japan accepted their offer. Joyous day, glorious happy days. The Japanese ever are stalwart ally against the Reds and other servants have agreed to see the Blagoveshchensk 
to our all-Russian government. It's been a little over a year since we first heard confirmation that the Japanese dive would review our request, and the wait has finally paid off. This morning, a one-man Japanese delegation arrived by plane to formally hand over the territory with the Vaz putting a signature to the agreement in Isaiah HQ. In return for ceding the, the tile in the province, We've granted the Japanese special rights to some of the natural resources in Far Eastern Siberia. Once we secure those resources and unite the region under stable government, the result in trade and mining deals will no doubt prove extremely fruitful for a reborn national state. For now, as the Voss has publicly confirmed that he will travel to his hometown post haste for a grand celebration now that it is officially back in Russian hands. Doubtless, the people will be overjoyed to live under our enlightened national socialist rule rather than the uncaring and distant Manchus. Today, Blagoveshensk. Tomorrow, Moscow. Yeah, huh, that's cool. Let's go and do the Free Russian Army. The warriors of the Russian Fascist Party are full of fervor and courage, yet they lack training and discipline necessary for an army of the modern age. Our forces, primarily composed of street fighters and militiamen of Habim, are hardly a match to our closest rivals that are the brightest officers of the white cliques, or at least American mercenaries at their disposal. What else to say about the Bolsheviks who fasten their sol soldiery with a fierce drill and don't shun any humane measures to achieve their pitiable victories? Or pitiable. If the restoration of Russia is brought, ought to happen and let it come to happen, the reform of the all Russian army should become our foremost priority. Our military minds will adopt the experience of Japanese and white army elders. Our recruits will be bound by the will of the party, and the military will become an organic entity, not to be disturbed by internal squabbles. Perhaps one day, the world will watch with amazement how a small band of followers would become a force to equal the mighty Wehrmacht. Yes, it will. Absolutely. Regional integration? Nice. Homecoming. Rapturous joy filled the streets of Blagoveshensk. Today, when Rodzinski arrived, the populace, encouraged by the black shirts who handed it out swastika flags and portraits of the Vaz, turned out in their hundreds to cheer on a glorious leader's procession as they marched through the chilly morning air to the town hall there. The mayor granted the Vaz the keys to the city and let the crowd in, a rousing rendition of farewell of Slavyanka. The Vaz was visibly overjoyed to be back in his hometown, tears freezing on his cheeks as he addressed the enthralled crowd in the armed black shirts keeping guard. This is a day we will live on in the history of our great nation, he stated. Today we will reclaim the very heart of the Russian government, for it was here that I, the Vaz of all the Russians, entered the world. Here over 50 years ago, the divine destiny of Russia began to unfold. Here, Holy Russia saw the genesis of its rebirth. Glory to Russia. The Vaz had one further honor to bestow upon the town. Henceforth, by Vaz's decree, it shall bear its own name in perpetuity. Blagovenshensk is dead. Long live the noble people of Rodzevsk. Welcome to Rodzevsk. Nice. Awesome, I guess. Oh, so that's the tile that you get. That's kind of nice. They have no factors. God dang it. Um, this I don't like being... I don't like the position we're in. I really don't. <laughs> it's not very good for us. Oh, oh, again, raid against Magadan, an American on the border. Our men on the northwestern border are tasked with watching the Mongols and Alden have reported the news. Or new arrivals, at least. Apparently, a small party counting among its number a Russian woman, as well as a man claiming to be an American, has requested entry into our territory. The man claims to be his planning to travel across all of Russia and thus would like to visit Zaya. Our men claim to not have found any reason to doubt him or his apparently legitimate travel documents. We must, however, be cautious. Although difficult and thus unlikely, it would not be impossible for a party of infiltrators from the renegades in Magadan or the Vlaleks in Cheetah to approach from the direction of Alden in an attempt to find a border zone with weaker security. Both groups would like nothing more than to see the Vals brought low and put in chains or worse. If he truly is who he says, however, he offers a golden opportunity, proving the strength and legitimacy of our government could possibly allow for us to gain more influence in the region and would assist considerably in advancing our goals of the regional and eventually national supremacy. They do not seem to be playing insurrection against the Vaz, but of course one can rarely tell the intentions of parasites, even if they were to make themselves known. What should we do with them? Let them continue? Arrest them? Let them continue. It's fine. I think they'll be okay. I want to beat up these guys. Uh, Magadan, how strong are these guys? 10,000 manpower, that's better than us. They have three divisions like us. Really? It says one to four. And Cheetah has three, so we're kind of screwed if we fight a two-front war. Actually, we're completely screwed if we fight a two-front war, but entry five, the all-Russian government of Amur. Although I'm still working to improve my Russian, I am able enough to understand a tense situation, the kind of which I, while trying to cross into Amur. Stopped by a border patrol of very rough-looking men, I found myself giving thanks to my earlier decision to employ Zoya's services. Through a combination of a rapid-fire Russian and my own documents, we were allowed to proceed to Zaya, the territory's capital, and the seat of the RFP's other Vaz. I must say, when I was told in Magadan about how depressing a place Zaya, in particular, and Amur in general ways, was, I was skeptical. But I am no longer. There is a pall of barely restrained violence hanging over everything, a feeling that if one places their foot wrongly, there will be immediate and severe consequences. I now well understand why Matkovsky's faction spit from the one here. Zoya and I, and I have quickly established a beneficial working arrangement, even as we improve each other's language skills, and she has told me she feels the same. Neither of us particularly wish to remain here for any length of time, and so once we are able to continue westwards, towards a land I am told maintains a pocket of old monarchism, and that has its own quarrels with the mirror, I cannot imagine why. That was a joke, Steve. Get better at writing sarcasm. 
Leaving this place behind will be a blessing, according to him. But the Free Russian Army has no breaks. We need more Japanese relations. We gotta suck, suck up to the Japanese. Japanese advisors is not bad. I do like that, but I do want to maximize this. The Rozevsk Military Academy. The politically conscious white officers and the anti-Bolshevik fighters who succeeded in the Japanese ways of war proved to be a great aid in our reconquest of the war, but as a core of the military, they alone aren't a force to rely on in the long term. The demands of ever-escalating war require us to nurture military traditions of our own, to supply formations with officer corps, and to provide it with professionals who embrace the experience accumulated by the greatest military minds of our age. We need to learn to forge military cadres through every available means. Thus, the Rozevsk Military Academy will function as the first ever war school of the new Russia. The Vals himself will be present in his hometown at the opening of the academy to great recruits and announce his hopes and his aspirations for the new generation of Russian officers who will bring glory to the fascist sword of fascists and kittens, though. Ooh, kittens! Go on, Rozevsk he said to the tiny figure of a kitten before him, Drink. In front of it was a bowl filled with warm milk. As his fingers touched its head, it hissed. Fierce kitten, when Rozevsky found him on the street of his new domain, it scratched its face. No man would dare mess with the little kitten, he thought. Brave and courageous in the face of absolute danger, its coat was a patchy and rough crisscross of monochrome, but its eyes were gold, bright golden discs. God gift to the Vods of Russians. And an aide entered. Rozevsky did not even notice the footsteps. Russia could wait, the world could wait, the Jew could wait, the party, Matkevsky, Mikhail, none of it mattered. The kitten's hisses and snorts mattered more than the aide report, its little tongue lapping the white richness in front of it soothed Constantine's heart more than anything else. The feeling of its fur coarse and dirty, dusty and grimace and grimy did not repulse him nor frighten him. At his touch was a new life, unsullied and unsoiled by the machinations of the world hostile to his ideas. Sir, the aide said, are you going to be quite all right? Yes, moreover, what are you doing here? Get out of here, Rodzieski thought. He was in no mood to send anyone to the firing line. No, nice kitty, sir. No, bad word. Have you thought of a name for it yet, sir? The question troubled Rodzieski. He had not given it a thought. What would be a good name for a bold kitten such as this one? Murrah. He's Murrah. Now get out. The aide promptly exited the room and left Rodzieski alone with his new friend, his new companion throughout the decades to come. Even the Vaz has a heart. Ah, bless his little heart. Very nice. Up next, secure the West. We uh, we probably want some of that. We oh, you know, just in case we're gonna get the new Asano Brigade because we need another division. A special episode in the history of the Russo-Japanese cooperation is the history of the Asano Brigade, an anti-communist formation of Haban youth that served along with the Imperial Japanese Army, formed under the auspices of an esteemed Kwa Tung Army officers. The brigade proved itself as a capable force against the communist partisans, a worthy asset to one of the strongest armies in Asia. Their valor was even compared to those of the samurai. The brigade was eventually disbanded, with many of them participating in the struggle against Bolshevism in the Far East, and later joining the anti-communist armies of Russia, including ours. As a matter of security against the resurgent Bolshevik threat becomes relevant for us both, we can petition the Imperial Japanese Army High Command for the creation of the 2nd Asano Brigade, which will not only serve the purpose of the common cause between the all-Russian government and the Empire of Japan, but also will provide us with a veritable, a reliable veteran group that will aid in our later campaigns. Good, because we're going to need them. And right now, I'm focusing exclusively pretty much on just, like, guns and artillery, because we are we are just not in a good position. The Far East is not easy to play. It's just really not that easy. Uh, let's go and do that. And since we have loot, or we all have loot, people might want to raid us. So, And I don't mind people wanting to raid us just because... Oh, we get 1.26 political power every single day. Just because that means we might be able to win on defense, we might be able to get more guns, get some more war support, and good stuff like that. Ah, the Svobodnaya Oroskuya Armiya. I swear to God, I need to learn Russian. But I kind of am. Slightly. Oh, there we go. Let's do that. Now, attacking here is probably a really bad idea, but we'll try it. Three versus two. Hopefully, we can do well. And let's go with that. More attack. And for you, we already have offensive, which is good. A graduation date. I swear by God, this holy oath, that I offer unconditional obedience to the vows of the Russian nation and people. Konstantin Rozevsky, the commander-in-chief of the all-Russian army, and that I am prepared as a brave soldier to risk my life for this oath at any time. Anton finished his Pledge of Allegiance with gusto, puffing out his chest. As he thumped his right fist against his chest and then threw it outwards and upwards to the assembled comrades, Glory to Russia, he shouted. Voice clear in the chilly ear of the lecture theater. Glory to Russia came the roaring, unified refrain of the cadets as they too saluted the army's newest lieutenant. Glory Russia barked Major Korbut, who also took his turn to salute before stepping in front of Anton, producing a lieutenant's bar fashioned from brass and pinning it to his breast. Lieutenant, lieutenant Anton Mikhailovich Melnikov, you are henceforth an officer of the all Russian army. You will now represent all that is best in the Russian race. You will not fail. You will not falter. You will not give a single step to the enemy. You will uphold the glory of the Vaz and the all Russian government against the Judeo Bolshevik menace and its puppets, wherever they might be found. Do you understand? Anton saluted again, stretching on his arm so far and fast that he felt something pop in. 
in his elbow. Yes, sir, glory to Russia. Gorbut nodded approvingly, and Anton Alarmsov a joyous grin. He knew he'd done well. He had earned top marks in every course, made child's play of every physical trial, and proven his loyalty by denouncing the degenerate homosexuals who have infiltrated the Rodzevsk Officer Academy, of course. As a good Christian man, he understood the value of humility. But in that moment, Anton Mikhailovich allowed himself to bathe in some well-earned pride, an exemplar of of the Russian people. And we shall wait for the all the divisions to get over here so we can beat up our enemies in the meantime. Arms from the spear. That would be good. Ooh, land auction would be nice as well. Uh, Japanese we support. Arms from the spear. Let's get some enough equipment first. First opening herself to the world during the Meiji Restoration and the 19th century, the Japan made a long way to becoming one of the world's leading superpowers, and an economic and industrial giant which exceeded in every area of production one could imagine. The almighty Zaibatsu, titans of the Asian economy, produced immeasurable amounts of guns and ammo, most of which aren't used immediately for the service of the Imperial Japanese Army, and the adjacent forces in the sphere, but instead are stored until better times. Those tools could be very useful for us. With insufficient arms production in our lands to compensate for the lack of equipment of our forces, we can obtain the surplus of Japanese guns and ammo for our handsome price and back up our promises to use them against our common threats, being those border bandits and, of course, communists. Let us try it, my friends. Let's see what they say. Actually, we could have waited for that first, but they pay tribute. Nice. And we got more political power. What's well, not to love? Now, this might be very bad, seeing as other people might want to come beat us up next. But you never know. You never, never know. A new Asana Brigade? Very good. Arms from the sphere. Joyous. And you guys are... No, oh, you're only 10 combat with. That's not great. But they have quite a few guys in there. And this infantry division is 12 combat with, which is okay. And then the militia divisions are 8 combat with. So, I hope this does not go poorly for us. But, I wonder if they're going to raid us. But let's just go and grab agricultural methods. That'll be worth it. That'll be very worth it. Land auction? Not bad. Reconnaissance, damage, garrisons, recovery rate goes down. I don't like recovery rate going lower. But we do get motorized infantry, we need that immediately. Armored cars, decades ago. Warfare in Siberia was conducted mostly by armored trains. As technology progressed, so did so too did weaponry. Armored trains evolved into armored cars, which evolved into trucks used for troop transport and logistical support. Now, more than ever, we have to take steps in order to secure and integrate new motorized equipment into our grand armed forces, both in the front line and logistical roles. This will help us give an edge to our army's performance and help us put along the road towards a modernized, effective fighting force, especially when we form dedicated mobile units. Surely our friends in Tokyo would be able to secure some surplus equipment for us even if we do not have to pay a premium for them. Strategic mobility at its heart, a central tenet of warfare, is an inherent trait in the Slavic race. Thus, it would only be natural that we adopt to this new equipment forward. Oh, well, we can do that one soon. Rethinking our tactics first. Do we need that one? Or... Yeah. One of the main reasons that the RFE failed to extend the authority westwards during the initial collapse of the Union was that, quite frankly, most of the tactics and strategies that we employed were based off archaic battle plans concocted by decrepit white army officer of... White Russian army officers. Human waves, the supremacy of the officer, grand battle plans, what were they thinking? Those officers and their, their service or cause is appreciated, but their specific contributions aren't. It's time that Rodzewski and his military's high command dra draft new strategic plans and large unit tactics in order to best prepare ourselves for the oncoming missions and conflicts. This way, we can ensure that the mistakes made nearly a decade ago won't be repeated, which is very, very good. More support. We gotta get more support. At least we have four divisions, that's nice. I hope when we get fight both of these guys that we don't have to do it at the same time. That'd be really, really bad. I and mean, even though, if they go to war with us, then we might be come over here. And that's why I'm rushing military stuff right now. We're going to get this one immediately. But happy 1962, everyone. Hope you're having a great year. And then we're going to do armored cars, because we, we got to get as many divisions as possible. And can we scavenge for loot? Improve relations with the Japanese. I, at, with this, you know, regional stage, or not the regional stage, the warlord stage, I just like to make sure we get as much PP as possible. Well, we could raid people, I guess, technically. Um, but we already had a successful raid, so rethinking inner tactics and armored cards would be very good. Military, military, military. That's what we got to focus on right now. I'd love to do this stuff, but national unions, uh, that hurts our factory out, but industrial expertise monthly change does go up. I do like that quite a bit, but I want to focus on this stuff as much as possible. Can by tie? More stability is good, too. Discipline force. Uh, black shirt field divisions, probably. Ooh. I don't want to hurt recovery, but whatever. One of the most valuable resources that we have at our disposal are the much feared black shirts, the most ideologically committed of our party members that form the core of our party's paramilitary. However, until now, we haven't been utilizing the black shirts to the best of our abilities, or their abilities. These fascist fanatics, known for their intimidatory tactics, 
extreme brutality and utter dedication to the Radzevsky, and the RFP's cause have previously been relegated to targeting civilian dissenters and ending internal opposition to the Vaz and his RFP. However, Radzevsky has a number of ideas for how to better use the black shirts, primarily to act as partisan suppression units and political commissars of source, installing them within and alongside of regular units to ensure cohesion and adherence to the party lines both among our soldiers and the civilians they rule over. Oh, we can raid these guys. I, I don't want to raid. I don't think our soldiers are ready yet. Our soldiers are just not that good. If we have to, we can lower this by one, but in the meantime, I'm actually going to lower or raise maybe this by one more as well. Because these guys are just, they're just very weak. They're just very, very weak. What, do we have anything in reserve? We have a little bit of artillery. This could give our guys just a little bit more push if we do that. Actually, if we do that again. We can make these guys, what we have currently, very strong. Actually, we got plenty of guns. Artillery has dropped by quite a bit, but that actually made our infantry divisions, while we don't have more, I would like to have more, that actually made them quite a bit stronger. Armored cars are nice. And let's go ahead. Oh, I want to raid. I really do, but I think it's best to wait. Oh! Ah! Motorized. It's only, oh, God, it's only eight combat with. Oh, Jesus. That's fine. That's what. Whatever. Anything else here? We're planning secure, secure control. They need loot. Actually, how, how many divisions does Cheetah have? Three divisions. We could probably beat them up. These guys have only three as well. 5v3. Oh, that is... Mm. We could risk it. Screw it. We're going to risk it. We'll teach these people who to mess, to mess with us. Or don't mess with us. A discipline force, though. Because I want to get more army training. About turn... Present arms? No, not like that, you filth. That's precise. It's as if you actually cared about your station here. You can expect to be eating your meal in the barracks poison if you're not careful. Currently, our armed forces are a colorful mixing pot of conscripted peasants, disaffected white emigres, and foreign mercenaries, as it stands. Our armed forces are in no position to be fighting prolonged conflicts. Oftentimes, our troops' discipline breaks down even fighting partisans and bandits. Now, new training regiments must be implemented. Disciplinary actions enforced and made harsher, and the incentivization schemes put into action to make sure that our troops don't break and run at the slightest indication of advers adversity. We need to ensure that our soldiers are the best, not just in the Far East, but in all of Russia, to demonstrate our superiority. Are we good to go? Because this one will happen somewhere here. I'm not really sure what's going to happen, so... Come on. Give it up. Give it up. There peace tribute. Of course. Alright, so it's over here, which is not bad. If it's 5v3, or 5v2, or if it's 4v2, or whatever it is, we should do relatively okay and begin just beating the crap out of the enemies. Raid successful. Great. Great, great, great. I, I think that was actually really, really good. That was actually really, really nice. The spoils of war. If you like it about that, please go ahead. More stability, more war support, more rifles. Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. Up next, I, I do want to get this one done for as long as fast as possible, so... The more defense we need, that secure the West. History truly has a tendency to repeat itself in the most deriding ways, as destined for Ataman Grigora, Grigory Semenyov, along with the Sham Tsar and the sycophant white officers, to arrive back at Cheetah in time for decades. Since the end of the Russian Civil War, the twist, of course, is that he once fought valiantly against the Reds for the righteous cause, but now he seeks to put down the nationalist Russian efforts against communism, no longer a paragon of Russian officer chivalry. He and his clique are lacking any noble goals and desiring only to enrich themselves at the expense of the puppet Tsar Mikhail. The earthly days of Semenyov, Shepanov, and other reactionaries are numbered and the throne of the pretenders crumbling apart. But as long as they persist, their popular principality remains an utmost rival to us. We should pay special attention to our borders with Cheetah in order to prevent any unwarranted intrusions from their side in which Magadan now wants their loot back. They can't have it. They will not have it. Let us spread out just a little bit more over here first and then we'll see what happens. Oh. Alright, so I don't know if it, was, it would be over here or not, but actually how much manpower do they have since we have none? The Vaz... 8,000, that's quite a bit, which is not good to spend for us. Secure the West. Enemy, of course, is defeated. Now I'm cleaning the corpses. Good. Good. Alright, so if that's the case, I'm going to put you guys here. Just in case we have to take these guys out first. We actually might be able to kill them, but I definitely want you guys over here. So we can just go over there really fast. Alright, what's going on here? We're going to do worker schools. Let's do schools. Improve relations with the Japanese. Secure the East. A despicable coward, pitiful traitor, a loathsome snake, Mikhail Matkovsky found himself at the mercy of the harsh environment of Magadan where he fled in the aftermath of his failed attempt to usurp the leadership of the anti-communist front for his own self-serving goals and isolated to the frozen outskirts of the Russian Far East. He was left with little means to survive but through the loyalty of his few adherents and the supply coming from the users of America. But his apparent miserable situation could not, be, could not fool us. If Mikhovsky ever su succeeded at anything, it was trickery and her ability to survive against all odds. Even in his desperate position, he will see 
seek to undermine us and use our movements to a weakness to strike us in the back. Leaving the borders with him unprotected, he would be foolish on our behalf. The fortifications in the north will provide us with a line of defense in our final strike against the Renegade. Good. Because I, I have played uh, Magadan before. Magadan? Magadan? And with Verbal, but I, I do remember this a little bit, so. And we do have a successful raid still. So it is what it is. And then under lock and key. One of the most amazing things about the territory controlled by the Constantine Rodzewski is the degree of social control that he's able to exert throughout it. From the small Siberian village to the bustling town of Rodzewski, the Black Church and the Russian fascist party have an extremely tangible presence, both through iconic iconography and people. Party bureaucrats and Black Church thugs are incredibly present, and very detailed registrars of individuals living within the shadows of the Vaz help these party members to track, catalog, and keep tabs on just about everyone, including those that are coming in and going out of the Amur region. While this is not the only means by which the RFP has a good handle on exactly who everyone is within their territory, it also means that they can effectively target would-be defectors trying to flee or prevent the ingress of subversive agents before they can do damage. The Vols likes to joke that he will soon have the entirety of Russia under lock and key. Very nice. We are good to go. Let us... Come on, Magadan. Try it. Try it, please. I want to kill your two divisions off badly. They need to die. And I'd love to do this. I want to get more wars, but we need to do this one as well, but Japanese advisors. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that a whole generation of white emigres in Asia were raised and trained by Japanese masters. The Japanese provided us with military assistance, organizational help, and they ultimately guided us towards victory over the Bolshevik forces at the edges of the Russian Far East. Although they left us to act without their supervision, and as soon as they helped the Russian fascist party to kickstart the Russian reunification, we can still benefit from the continuous assistance. Requesting the Japanese support wouldn't be a shameful decision to take for our national pride as the Bolshevik governments enslaved and oppressed all specialists we could use at our disposal. As with our de ties deepen, or ties have been deepened, we can offer lucrative positions within the ranks of our military and, econ and economics to the advisors from Japan assisting for the mutual benefit of our countries. We have six divisions here. Do we? Do we really have six? We have no manpower left, and we gotta save whatever we have, but that is amazing. Nice. Scavenge for loot. Raid against Magadan. Get more relations with the Japanese Border Patrol. The gunshots, barking dogs, and the bright lights coming from both vehicles and flashlights are indicative of a nightly Border Patrol, the same ones that Anton Shevitz and his wife-to-be were trying to avoid. Bundled in the warmest clothes they had, including thin jackets and boots, they both had large packs on their back. Schwetz had recently been outed for his Jewish heritage by a neighbor who had done some looking into his family history. Not intending to wait around for his execution, he convinced the woman he loved to flee with him westwards towards Irkutsk. Avoiding the roads, the pair made their way westwards along the ditches to the left of what few roads there were, even in the day. Traversing the Siberian wilds was dangerous, but in the pitch black of night it was impossible. And so the two refugees continued, seemingly at a snail's pace, trying to avoid the obvious in interactions with anyone else, especially the RFP's incredibly strict border patrols. Schwetz, who had once worked as a logistics administrator for the very border patrols he was now avoiding, knew the reputation that they held. Frequently, they would simply execute those fleeing the regime on sight. Those that they didn't execute, they tortured and interrogated in case they were enemy agents, occasionally. So the stories went that patrols would even enter territory not controlled by Rozeski and terrorize with villages within the range. Shvats kept all this in mind as he trudged ever westwards, following the road on his depressed shoulder. However, they eventually reached a bridge that spanned a shallow but surely rigid river. Shvats looked at his partner, and then back at the bridge before the distant sounds of motors began to rise over the din of wildlife. Lights began to peek over a hill across the bridge, and Shvats was forced to make a decision. He gave a simple command, get down, and lay down, in a prone position by the side of the road. Initially, Shvats had considered either attempting to run across the bridge or go through the water, but both would meet certain death, the latter from the cold and wet, and the former from the fastest. As the pair lay there, the pair lay there. They waited for the patrol to pass, feeling these sets of tires. They counted one truck, two. Where was the third? Shvet slowly raised his head to see a third truck stop shortly after the bridgehead, and there were soldiers getting out of it. Run, Shvet yelled, but as a woman he was with stood up to flee, she was shot twice. Shvet, reluctant to move, slowly put his hands up from his prone position as a soldier surrounded him, all quiet on the northern front. Not bad. And let's see what Magadan has to say to us. Has Burgundy finally done it? Let's hope so. Basing rights. We have established links with the Japanese by foot, but did little to nothing to expand our links by the sea, although we enjoyed a great deal of diplomatic pleasantness and gifts coming from the borders with Manchuria. Manchuria. The means to reach our shores to the Japanese sailors and naval traders remain non-existent. The closest point of collision between Amur and Japanese traders is a small settlement in Chumakan, once a harbor for Russo-American steamboat trade, but remained unavailable to the modern trading boat and is completely unusable as a port. Although while Chumakan isn't a second Vladivostok, and neither is it a second Magadan, for that matter, it has potential to become an important crossroad between the Japanese Isles and the rest of Russia. Should we accommodate Chumakan with modern boat equipment and grant the Japanese liberties within the settlement, our trade with Tokyo will be enhanced even further. Go ahead and raid them. Let's see what they can do. They refuse tribute, so be it. 
So be it, Japan. Or not Japan, Magadan. Let's see. And we win immediately. Awesome. And as you can see, my friends, we are currently winning the border war between us and, uh, well, I guess John Peters and versus Vasily Tsirin. Tyrson. But anyways, they wanted to take the loot we got from them, and they wanted it back. But, as we can see, they ain't gonna get it back. And the enemy, of course, is thankfully defeated. We get slightly more stability, some more political power, and rifles. Nice. Very, 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 very nice. I love it. And we're currently doing the basing right focus, which is very good. Alright, let's set ourselves up for greatness. And do lessons from the Ken Pai Tai. The Ken Pai Tai, the Jidame arm of the Imperial Japanese Army, is an amazing sight to behold. A centralized force against the anti Japanese elements within the country and abroad, the Ken Pai Tai is a pervasive organization that keeps order within the Empire and enforces its will on disloyal subjects as a direct result of the Ken Pai Tai's hard work. Japan doesn't have a problem with the wreckers sabotaging their orders or degenerates trying to taint their noble culture. The Black Shirts and other forces of internal security could use a few lessons from their Japanese colleagues, perhaps even with advice from from their consultants. In order to create a force that is capable of ensure stability and suppress the Judeo-Bolshevik investigators whenever they rear their ugly heads. We can use the Japanese Kenpai Tai as a model to follow in our beginning. Very nice. Death in the family, oh no. But let's get some research done first before we settle over there. Let's grab some more guns, that'd be very good, or at least gun upgrades, and then oh, land auction, yes please. Army reserve training, nice. More organization, always, always important. Very good. Vitaly Grinin was a simple man, a farmer in the rather barren lands of the Russian Far East, a loving father, a dutiful husband, a loyal soldier of the Red Army, and one of the few Jewish men of the Far East. Grinin, Mr. Grinin, was dead. Cancer claimed him in the night. His family, lucky enough so far to avoid the attention of the mad Vazenzea, could not only mourn him. It was dangerous to be seen as a Jew in the slam. The Amur region would soon have them all in camps if they were not careful. Vitaly's oldest son, Benjamin, had put on a discreet call for volunteers to aid in the Tarara. Ta Tahara. Slowly they came from outlying villages. Ben recognized all but one of those who came, a man who had the look of a wanderer about him. As he began the cleansing of Vitaly's body, it was clear that the man was not of the faith, yet he was determined to see the rituals through. Eulogies were made in memory of the fallen father. Finally, the body was wrapped in his prayer shawl and sheet. As his body was lowered into the grave, the psalms were read, and when the time came for Shiva, Ben, and his family, they retreated to their home, and the visitors slowly left. The stranger did not leave, however. He stayed silent as he sat with them in their home. Finally, Ben spoke up and asked a simple question, Why? The stranger looked intently at him, a light of embarrassment seemed, seemed to pass in his eyes before he spoke. He saved my life, in the war I did not deserve it, and yet he saved me. His reply was met with confusion at first. What could that he mean? <clears throat> was he a soldier of the Red Army? A deserter, perhaps, then? With the force of a train, it hit Ben. Vit Vitaly had told him a story years ago of a young German soldier who disobeyed orders and was shot by his comrades who were trying to save Russian citizens, or civilians. He looked at the man in the whole new light, and as the night fell, he stayed. He stayed until the Shiva was over. The week passed, and he left on the eighth day. Protect me, Eternal One, for I seek refuge in you. Japanese trucks? I think we do some trucks. Trucks are very good to use. They have very strong trucks. And onward to liberation, we have taken a number of steps to ensure that our army is ready for war. First, with the renegade and the false Tsar. And then with the Bolsheviks to the west. Our strategic thought has been modernized. The Black Shirts integrated with our frontline formations. We have secured ourselves a source of motorized equipment and have drastically increased the discipline of our troops. It wasn't easy. In some cases, the process is still finishing up. But at this point, it's become clear that a ragtag group of peasants, mercenaries, and ideologues has been transformed into an effective fighting force that is prepared for the liberation of all of Russia. Finally, Rodzevsky's dreams were beginning to become clear of Russia. Under the firm control of the true RFP and himself, the Vaz, at the helm of the nation, onwards to liberation, Villa Rossi. Nice. <clears throat> more relations? Yes, please. What do we want? Do we, we don't need more guns right now. Artillery, are we? We're not making any artillery right now, are we? No, we're actually using up a little bit of our stockpile, which is not good. But let's see. Electronics? I like that quite a bit. Industry is very, very good. Ooh. We gotta be careful how much PP we spend, because we do need core things as well, but saboteurs strike. There's an alarming trend growing on our borders. Oh no. The traitors in Magadan seem to have struck a deal with the Tsars and Cheetah. A temporary truce and alliance even. The minds of Mikhail and the Kotsky are foggy and unclear as ever. This morning, our forward observers have found our border guards dead and their weapons missing. This incident is hardly isolated. The intensifying raids coming from both sides of the border, as well as the destruction of valuable remnants of Union roads and rail, have become more and more frequent. Our forces are stretched then, barely enough to cover the one side of the front. When the Tsars attack, the traitors join them, forcing us to expel our resources into two directions. We inevitably lose some of the process, whether it is men, weapons, or plain loot. 
Rozevsky sits in his office, pondering what to do next. This pact has marked a turning point in the relationship between the three components of the anti-Bolshevik front. Only one can wonder what fate awaits them next. Will the Tsarist and the Traitors win against a divinely sanctioned vase of Russia, or truth triumph against treachery? Only time will tell, and we wait patiently. Oh boy. We all knew this was going to happen eventually. It's not going to be good. But, like I said earlier, hopefully we can get our motorized over here and just get across here and destroy these divisions as fast as possible. And if we can do that, we basically will have won. I think they need to take pretty much every single victory point here before we lose. So, that's the main goal. Pin these guys here. Pin them here. Destroy them. Circle destroy lessons from the Kenpai Tai, though. Uh, Tohaku Tanaka was a rarity among the Kenpai Tai. He could speak fluent Russian. From his time in Habin and working with the Russian white movement that the Japanese had harbored in opposition to the USSR, Kohatku took a great interest in the language and learned it quite well in his years spent in Manchuria. Because of this, the aging Kenpai Tai agent made it a natural choice for being sent to Zaya. It's the last one we promise, and then you're done, was what he was told when he protested the assignment. He had wanted to retire for quite some time. He hadn't seen his hometown in decades, and he certainly wasn't getting any younger. But now, Kohaku found himself in the freezing Amur region, instructing Russian blackshirts in the ways of descent suppression, a hard series of lessons learned by the Kenpai Tai in Japan, Korea, China, and beyond. They had been instrumental in the immediate post-war, ensuring that the co-prosperity sphere was secure. Kohaku himself hadn't played a significant role in that, but he had been briefed and trained on exactly what he was done and how, and in turn, he would go about imparting the information on the Russians. It wasn't a perfect system, but it did work. Kohaku, after a brief seminar about information extraction and torture, found himself at, sat at his desk in front of the classroom, making some notes in Japanese to send back to his handlers in Harbin, specifically about the material and his clarity. As he wrote, he was interrupted by a knock at the door. Come in, Kohaku spoke, his Russian heavily influenced by his Japanese accent. A younger black shirt, perhaps no older than 24, entered. It was typically unusual to see such young students, but Kohaku knew him. Vlas Kozlov. He was a good study. Asked a lot of questions, and his reputation for brutality was already known among his older peers. Mr. Kohaku Kozlov spoke. I had a question about a seminar that I attended of yours a few days ago. You spoke about the suppression of dissent in recently conquered territories. When you spoke, you mentioned separating families and communities based on cultural lines. What if there are no variant cultural lines to separate? It was a good question, Kohaku thought before responding. Then, you look for other differences. Peasant and noble, farmer and factory worker, anyone you can conquer. But to ensure those conquests remain, you must divide. Cultural lines are the easiest to divide upon, but any division will work. If it gets done, the methodology matters not. And right now, we're just literally waiting for them to go to war with us. Um, I don't like it that we're over here, but I don't think we can rush for Magadon early on. Because once we take destroy these divisions, we've got to shift our lines over here. And I really want to keep that guy over there as much as possible. So, ooh, actually, this tile is separate. So we had to take this one and then that one. Oh, boy. That is not good. But just in case, we need both of these. So, define the enemy. Rozeski's paranoia. National Union, so we don't have to deal with anything else during the whole conflict. The degree of control exerted by the state on the unions has often been a touchy subject amongst many RFP, senior RFP members. However, it's clear that they do have their uses. They motivate the workers, help their factories, they follow production quotas, and increase their support amongst the lower sectors of society. We must take action to ensure that our soldiers of industry not only have their protection, but that their protection is overseen directly by the administration. We will found the National Komitet Prozuznogo Prezirania, the Union Oversight Committee, which answered directly to Rodzewski. Thus, only unions that receive the personal approval of, of our beloved Vaz, Rodzewski himself, will be able to operate with absolute impunity. This will be done so that they can work closely with the NKPP and the state to ensure the workers' adherence to the party line. Anything else is entirely unacceptable as we work towards a strong, united state. A unified state for the workers. And anything else? Yes, we could do this. We could do it against the trans peoples. But they have how many divisions? Four. Oh, they have four. And these guys have up to four, too. Oh, that is not good. Uh, it's not really worth raiding those guys. Oh, but we can... Hold on. Uh, we could risk it. National Union. So be it. So be it. For the homeland. There wasn't much in the way of a soldier's comforts for those who were part of the VOD's all-Russian army. Harsh weather, harsh discipline, and harsh enemies were what a lot of the older soldiers claim were the three harshes that all fascist soldiers had to overcome to become a true man. This wasn't entirely untrue, but it wouldn't be too accurate to paint Morozevsky's army as an entirely draconian organization. Morale was high, higher than it had ever been. Individuals like Yuri Orlov, the 16-year-old who had lied about his age to join the army, was more than just unwilling conscripts. 
Orlov, who had lost his father during the war with the renegade in Magadan, was an ideological fanatic who had been indoctrinated by both his father and his schooling to believe in the Russian fascist party, and the Vols was a paramount temporal authority on Earth. Starstruck, and soon after his 16th birthday, Orlov went to the recruitment office and signed up for the army. Not exactly the perfect physical specimen, Orlov was a little shorter than most and was certainly skinnier than what he should be, as likely a result of malnutrition. That being said, he was an ideologically motivated as most fanatical black shirt, but he wasn't the only one. Yuri found himself and his brothers after training one day with nothing to do, a rare moment in the rigorous life of an all-Russian soldier, when his brethren opted to go to church and then head into the nearest town. Yuri decided to stay back in the barracks and read. He had attained a series of pocket versions of the Vaz's work from his local black shirt political officer, including the Azbuka Fajizma and the contemporary Judaization of the world or the Jewish question in the 20th century. Both of the works were on the older side of the Vaz publications, but Orlov had wanted to start from the beginning. Having stored his rifle properly in this casual dress, Orlov had laid back on his uncomfortable bunk and opened his pocket book. The 16-year-old, who never had been exposed to any other ideology in his entire life, was enamored by the topics covered, including the toxicity of Bolshevism and the dangers of the Jewish conspiracy. And when his friends came back from the day in the town, he was excited to discuss with them all he had learnt from the Vaz writing. Brothers, listen, we must be wary of the Bolshevik. We must be. <clears throat> the corporate state? Yes, please. It is of a paramount importance that we begin reorganizing our economy and society as a whole around the tenets of corporatism. That is, the organization of society by groups such as agriculture, labor, and military, to name a few. Each one of them representative of their own interests, but ultimately cooperating with one another for the good of a greater Russia. For the farmers are the bleeding heart of the state and the laborers toiling for hours on end are Russia's grit, muscles, and sinew. The military, ever vigilant against communists and splitters, are Russia's long arms and stone-like fists. The Vaz will help Russia transcend the confines of a traditional economy and realign herself towards a more efficient corporate entity. And let us see what they say. They have no one on the border. They refuse tribute. So be it. The National Union is not bad. The corporate state. Hopefully no one shows up. Which looks like it might just happen, maybe. Maybe, 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 maybe. I was guessing he's paranoia. If we have to. So be it. It's no secret that the Russian fascist party, and by extension, its head, Rozevsky, have witnessed countless betrayals by so-called peers. Not only have these betrayals been personal attacks on the Vaz, but many of the most prominent among them, the renegade in Magadan, and the Tsarist in Cheetah, have been directly linked to the failures of the RFP and Rozevsky, stalling for years the liberation of Russia from the communist yoke. Hey, successful, as it should be. But no longer. If there's been anything that the Vaz has learned since the failure of the United Front, is that no one can be trusted. Success comes from personal hard work, and the ability to get things done as an individual. Nothing else will suffice. It is time to take stock and clean house. From the lowest party official to Rodzewski's inner circle, none will be exempt from scrutiny, and traitors will be dealt with in the harshest of ways. Very good. We must be ready. And we gotta have a good general here. Hold. Do not move. Do not move. Food for the hungry. Very good. And there goes Madagascar. Nice. Anything else from uh, Japan? Shipments? Uh, we do one for industry, why not? Industry is very good to do. Yes, due to crisis. Out with a crash. The corporate state. Rozevsky's paranoia. Now, what are they going to attack? I, I, I don't like it that they're just taking so long. Oh, Cheetah. Well, all right, boys. I guess we're heading down to Cheetah then. Kill off as many as you possibly can right now. That'll be super important. And we're not even making any divisions because we have no manpower, so. Give us some time. And, good. And agricultural methods. Ten days. And we should have enough soldiers. And we have enough forts down here, too, so... That is good. Improve relations? Eh, do it just in case. Mm, good luck. You're gonna need it. 48 divisions, no artillery, which is nice to see. And then, Rozeski's paranoia will be... Ooh, I don't want her organization. They're probably gonna attack when I do this one. After a year. I want to avoid that one as much as possible, so we'll get eyes in every home. The national purification doesn't end at the top. It also has to cover the bottoms. To make the population comply with our ideals, targeted repressions and purges are not enough. We need to ensure submission and vigilance at every level of Russian society. While well, the Black Shirts will continue to intensify their regular activities against the enemies of the nation, the burden of the anti-treason efforts will be imposed not merely on them, but also on the patriotic conscious citizens of Russia who will aid our efforts against the traitors. A neighbor will watch over his neighbor, the children will be encouraged to report on their dissent, dissident parents, and our servicemen will be hidden in plain sight, ready to uncover anti-state activities at any given moment. Every aspiring insurgent will find himself surrounded by atmosphere of constant terror and persecution, not being able to take a step without fear of retribution. As it should be. They really want this general to do well here. But we have bigger plans, and we definitely have plans for this, so. There we go. You must go there, though. Oh, 
eyes in every home. The paranoid Vaz, Konstantin Rozevsky, Vaz of all Russians, and true leader of the Russian fascist party, drifted into his office. In his traditional pseudo-military garb, removing his hat, he set it down on his archaic oak desk and ran a hand through his grizzled hair. Another sleepless night, he grumbled to himself as he sat himself in the chair, sighing as he did so. Reports of troop movements, suspected traitors, and production quarters had already been placed neatly on his desk, luckily by some orderly or assistant whose name he couldn't be bothered to remember. They were all signed by his confident Bolotov, who'd become one of his closest allies in the past decade. He didn't even bother with any of the reports except those regarded, regarding suspected traitors. Opening the portfolio marked internal dissent, Rozelsky reviewed some of the names, muttering to himself, Bogachev... Chakchev. His eyebrows raised the third name and read, Ryzhov. Mikhail Ryzhov had been an extremely loyal senior party official in Zaya, and Rozevsky had known him personally for a number of years, but it sort of made sense. About a year back, he had made a joke about the party's financial infrastructure in Zaya, and Bolotov had produced some fairly convincing evidence that linked him to the long-gone Zaya banker, Berezinsky, who had attempted to hide his Jewish ancestry. The father's grimace. Replacing Ryzhov would be a pain, but if he had fraternized with Berezinsky, what other company had been keeping? He picked up the phone on his desk and dialed his trusted security minister. I've seen the new list. Move on. Ryzhov. Move on them all. The truth was that Ryzhov was innocent. The only contact he ever had with Berezinoi was when he was verbally assaulted him for his Jewish ancestry. The Vaz's paranoia had clouded his judgments, but as long as Bolotov kept producing traitors, Rozevsky's paranoia would be sated. Ever since the renegades split the party and the United Front fell apart, the all-Russian state was dominated by the Vaz's suspicions. The clouds, of course, darken. Man, you take forever to move there. He really does take a while, doesn't he? That sucks. Japanese electronics might not be bad, but... Artillery is looking very good. We don't have enough arm XP. I would like more, but whatever. Defying the enemy? I really want to avoid this one so badly. Ooh. That is just not good for us. That is not good. Maybe I should have taken that one first, maybe, but... It's a little bit too late for that. <clears throat> I'm going to wait for this one. So, define the enemy. We cannot sincerely proclaim our mission for a strong and independent Russia when we remain unaware of the enemy who dedicated his whole life to destroy the motherland we love and cherish. Even having experienced a communist whip under their own skin, many of our countrymen are easily attracted by the messages of tolerance taking anti-Semitism as a sign of barbarity, not as a justifiable answer to the prolonged attempts of the elders of Zahn to subdue free nations to their will. To keep the Russian people on their path from deliverance from Bolshevik tyranny, it is our sacred duty to enlighten them about their true enemy, the Jewish international cabal that seeks to spread its tentacles throughout the lives of communism and liberalism. The most destructive ideologies of the 20th century that brought countless misery to Russia. The Jewry derives its power from illusions and tricks it pulls on the ignorant souls. Once a Russian man learns to see through it, their power crumbles like a house of cards. Good, good, good. And the trucks are there, ready to go. They are poised to strike. Come on, Magadan. Come on, Cheetah. Try it. You know what? Our own patriarch? I like that one. Ooh. Oh, the Alsing Eye. One of the few remaining organizations within the Vaz territory, with the intent to end the rule of Konstantin Rozevsky, were the Sons of the Tsar, a minor group of monarchists who were sympathetic to Mikhail II's cause. They mostly occupied lower bureaucratic positions in the town of Rozevsk, previously protected by the incompetence of the Manchukovan authorities and utterly cut off from the white movement in the east. They had been hiding in plain sight, so to speak, that was until one of the members had lost his nerve. Following the interrogation, standard procedure by the Blackshirts for rooting out traitors, he had decided to come clean, approaching the party's head office in Rozevsk. He told the officials everything he knew, plans, meeting places, individuals involved in their degree of involvement. When he was done, the party officials laughed. One mentioned that they had taken down resistance movements for three times as large as his. They promised him immunity from prosecution, but on his way out, he was promptly arrested. The man, forced into a truck with a number of black shirts, was brought out and forced to bear witness as every member of his dissenting movement was rooted out. Each time, the black shirts made a big show of the man's role in the collapse of the movement, curtsying and bowing in the most sarcastic of manners and thanking him in, super in superfluous ways. Superfluous ways, patting him on the back and acting as if they were his best friend, all in front of his former compatriots who he had helped bust. As the last of the names and the list were ticked off, the man was taken to the outskirts of the city and shot, ultimately being left unburied. The rest were simply imprisoned in the work camps and relegated to forced labor. For while it may be terrible to be a traitor, there's nothing worse than to be a traitor to the traitors, for no honor at all is spared. More manpower for the camps? What's not the love? Ah, new Supreme Council, why not? Nobody's above fascist law, and the high numbers of the Supreme Council of the Russian Fascist Party are not in an exemption. Although the Council is supposed to be represent the most active and devoted members of the party, from the very beginning it was filled with careerists and traitors who cared nothing about but their welfare. It would be foolish to assume that those kinds of people who disappeared with Mikovsky as their marks of treachery are evident in every aspect of life in this state. Every single instance of disinformation, corruption, and disobedience, even at the lowest levels, could be linked to the highest body of the all-Russian government, with the same names constantly reappearing in the Blackshirt papers that are 
gathered on Radzevsky's desk. Lavaz always looked with suspicion towards his closest associates, and now he wills to issue his judgment towards every single one of them. To evaluate the degree of their treachery, some are indeed faithful followers of fascism, but more of them have baggage to hide behind the eyes of the black shirts. The enemy. And here we go, my friends. It seems like Magadan finally wants to take us out, but citizens of all Russia, by decree of the Vaz, the following groups are hereby declared outlaws, traitors, and enemies of the state, the Jewry, all Jews, wherever they might hide, are the mortal foes of God's people and the antithesis of our pure Russian culture. They are the greatest enemy that the civilized world has ever faced, yet they feign the appearance of weakness. Be not fooled by their numbers or appearance, for they will seize any opportunity to grow fat upon the blood of yourself and your family. When you find a Jew, you must not hesitate, be it a man, woman, or mewling spawn, act swiftly and without mercy. If you are outnumbered, report to the local RFP militia, for the Jews possess a low cunning that makes them dangerous in numbers. And Bolsheviks, a vile mix of Jews and their groveling servants. The Bolsheviks were the means by which the elders of Zan laid low holy Russia. Bolsheviks are easily recognized even when disg disguised, thanks to their tendencies towards distinctly Jewish behavior. They are mad ideologues who will not hesitate to commit acts of theft and murder to further their aims of their masters. However, deception is second nature to them, and they will go to any lengths to obfuscate their true identities. If you suspect someone to be a Bolshevik or influenced by Bolshevism, report them immediately to your nearest Russian fascist party representative. And Freemasons, the most cunning and subtle of our forces, the Freemasons are agents of the Judeo-Bolshevism who infest the circles of wealth and power. Any man of substance, means, or intellect who has not sworn absolute loyalty to the Vlad is a possible Freemason or agent thereof, and should be subject, subjected to intense scrutiny at all times, should a friend, relative, or acquaintance begin to accumulate wealth without sufficient explanation, or a man or woman or show interest in intellectual matters, and form a Russian fascist party representative, he shall begin a thorough investigation to set your mind at ease and ensure the safety of your people. Do your duty to God for family and nation, be ever vigilant, and help keep Holy Russia safe, free, and secure, always good to stay informed. And actually, you know what? Screw it. Because they're starting to do that one, we will go ahead and do our own patriarch. Screw it. Few strata of Russian society suffered from Bolshevik tyranny as an Orthodox clergy, the imposed exile, the threat of murder, seizure of property, and forced denial of the faith. What hardships had they not endured under Lenin and Bukharin? Even after the end of the Soviet rule, many of them remained morally broken in the wake of the horror they experienced and don't attempt to return to their traditions, instead of indulging themselves in apathy and at times heresy, with a moral and obligation to decay in the church. It is our duty to rebuild it for the service of the nas Russian, nation. Russian nation. The Russian Orthodox Church will be royally organized under the supervision of the state and the Vaz himself and the spiritual affairs will be guided by the new patriarch of all Rus, who embody the symphony of fascist rule and orthodox faith. And let's read one more for fun. For Holy Russia, because we're going to need that war sport. If there's a single thing that defines the Russian fascist party among its ideological fellows, it is their high spirituality and unfeigned devotion to the idea of the Third Rome, to the orthodox faith that held together Russia for a thousand years and came to her aid in difficult times. How could it be any different? Adopting the principles of fascism as it was envisioned by Hitler and Mussolini, we brought it to the Russian soul and made it embrace the Russian traditions, very spiritual in nature. The Bolsheviks knew the strength that lies in the Orthodox Church and by all means try to destroy it to deprive the Russian people of their faith and make it worship their satanic cults of Mordecai and Marx and Lenin. If the cults of moral depravity and blasphemy for such insults we will not stand. Once more, Russia will be the paragon of Christian faith and God himself will guide his warriors against the forces of the devil. But I hope you enjoyed today's first episode as we play as Amur. If you enjoyed it, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below and I'll see you tomorrow when we are going to have to wage unholy war against our enemies and have a good time doing so. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.